Good morning, folks, and welcome to St. James United Church in beautiful Waterdown, Ontario, Canada. And uh, we'll begin with uh, Everlasting God and Make Me a Channel of Your Peace.
We uh, open ourselves to the one who gave us life. We bring ourselves before God, our creator. Linda is going to share with us now uh, in a prayer of thanks, from a prayer of thanksgiving address from the Haudenosaunee people, uh, also known as the Iroquois or Six Nations, including Mohawk, Oneida, Cayuga, Onondaga, Seneca, and Tuscarora. These are the local people who lived on this land for countless generations before we or our ancestors arrived. So after the prayer, um, there is a section where we are asking the congregation to participate. And after I read a section, you will repeat, you, you will um, respond by saying, now our minds are one. And there's a couple of sections. The people. Today we have gathered and we see that the cycles of life continue. We have been given the duty to live in balance and harmony with each other and all living things. So now we bring our minds together as one as we give greetings and thanks to each other as people. Now our minds are one. Now our minds are one. within it. We acknowledge the many nations that walked this land in the past. We acknowledge that we gather together on the traditional lands of the Haudenosaunee, Etiwanda Run, and the Mississaugas of the Credit Peoples on the lands connecting with the Niagara Treaty of and the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant. With this, we respect the long-standing relationships that indigenous nations have to this land as they are the original caregivers. We acknowledge historical and ongoing injustices that indigenous peoples, First Nations, Métis, and Inuit endure in Canada. We accept responsibility as a public institution to contribute towards revealing and correcting miseducation as well as renewing respectful relationships with indigenous communities through our teaching, research, and community service. Now I want to invite somebody special to come forward. I, I, I'm tempted to call him a special guest, but he's not a guest because he's been a member of this congregation for a very long time, and I've managed to recruit him back this morning. Uh, Governor General award-winning history teacher Nathan Tidridge. Nathan, would you come and share some thoughts and words with us this morning? Thank you. Thank you. It's good to be among uh, some familiar faces. Uh, when Rick asked me to come and speak today, I was, uh, I was deeply touched, um, especially given the subject. Um, this is a, a, an important moment, I think, for our country that we're experiencing right now. Uh, and we're talking a lot about it at the high school where I teach just down the road. And so I thought I would uh, uh, root it there, uh, but I wanted to tell you that uh, the, the the teachings and the truths that, that I'm sharing have been given to me, have been gifted to me uh, by colleagues of mine, uh, Indigenous colleagues of mine, and I wanted to, to thank them for their patience with me as I've, I've learned uh, the truths over these past many years. I thought I would start with uh, a passage from Thomas King. Thomas King is a professor at uh, the University of Guelph. He's a, an amazing writer. He's an indigenous man. Uh, you may know some of his works, Truth and Bright Water, uh, The Truth About Stories, The Inconvenient Indian, uh, among others. And uh, he's uh, 
I always read to the students this passage from his uh, Massey lecture, The Truth About Stories. And in it, he gives a, he, he tells his own personal story. And, uh, and then he concludes his personal story by saying, I tell stories, I tell you these stories, uh, not to play on your sympathies, but to suggest how stories can control our lives. For there is a part of me that has never been able to move, move past these stories, a part of me that will be chained to these stories as long as I live. And I think that's what Canada is, is dealing with right now. It's learning its stories, and it's learning stories that are, that are chained to it. And, uh, and it's an important moment. And some things that I think for us in Waterdown that we need to know is that we, we exist on Indigenous territory. We exist on the territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit, as well as the lands of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Wendat Confederacy, and the Neutral Nation. So our town's history includes a history of dispossession of land uh, from Indigenous peoples. And those nations are still here. They still exist. They still live here. Uh, treaties are part of our land story. Uh, they were never extinguished. They were concluded between the settlers and the Indigenous people, and they worked for longer than they didn't. Um, and even though they weren't extinguished, uh, successive Canadian governments have worked to erode them through events like Confederation and through uh, acts such as the Indian Act. Uh, created in 1876, the Indian Act remains the law of the land to this day. Uh, it was built on the definition of a person being, and I quote, anyone other than an Indian. That definition remained in the Indian Act until 1951, but the structures that were built atop of it uh, still remain. And we deal with the legacy of the Indian Act today. The first thing it did is it created a, a monolithic term, Indian. It's based on an old Spanish word, Indias, which means subhuman. It's used by a government today to identify a diverse group of people regardless of their pre-existing or distinct political, cultural, or social realities. It placed the power of who is and who is not an Indian under the Indian Act, not in Indigenous communities' hands, but in the hands of the Canadian government, where it remains to this day. If you want to live on a reserve, it's not to the Indigenous community that you go, it's to the Government of Canada to seek permission because they own all reserved lands. They disrupted Indigenous governance structures and imposed on them an elected chief and council. Chief is a, is a European name, it's not an indigenous one. Um, and they created that system, uh, a system that still exists to this day. It established reserves and placed them under the direct control of the federal government. And it appointed Indian agents who still exist today. Settlers are banned from going on reserves, although that's not uh, enforced anymore and Indigenous people were banned from leaving them up until just recently. And lastly, it established the legal mechanism which remains to this day for Indigenous residential schools. Those are still the law of the land, even though the last one uh, was closed in 1996. And I wanted to tell you that uh, how I kind of, my eyes were opened was uh, at Waterdown High, about 10, 12 years ago, they gave us a free trip to a residential school. The, uh, this part of a school board initiative, we're inundated with these. And uh, I said, oh, it's a free trip. This will be great. I'll take my students. And I knew, I knew generally about residential schools. They were addressed in about three sentences in the textbook. Um, so I knew that, what, that they existed, I, but I had no idea about what they were. And so I took uh, 30 students without context, cold, to the mush hole, which is about 30 minutes away. It's the closest residential school to us. The kids in this community would have been forced to go there. And um, I, can't, I can't even begin to describe because it was before, it's now being restored. But the thing that struck me was, uh, it was all, it's on Six Nations territory and it's staffed by survivors. And so we went in and in each room, we would meet a survivor and they would tell us, and it was mostly women. The women, women know that they typically bear the brunt of trauma. The men typically shut down, but the women were there to kind of guide us through the, their stories. And it was horrifying. And as a teacher, I realized that I was witnessing an example of education being weaponized. 
And my middle daughter, uh, or sorry, my oldest daughter was four at the time, which would have been the age that they would have been taken to the school, just as soon as they were uh, diaper trained. That that's when they would be taken. And um, yeah, I, I had no response to it. And kids kept on asking me questions and I had no idea. I had no idea what I had stepped into. And then one boy said, he said, this is what I imagined Auschwitz to look like, in reference to the Second World War camp. And I'd been to Auschwitz. And I turned to him, and we were standing in the back, and I said, yeah, it has that same feeling. And so, um, oh, another, one other thing is the um, depressions in the ground from the mass graves. They've what's being revealed across the country right now is not a surprise. Indigenous people have known about them forever, but the funding to excavate was denied by the government for years. What happened in Kamloops now, because of the news media, it's forcing that hand to, to find them. They're just beginning to look at uh, the Mohawk Institute right now. And uh, when that news comes out, it will be shocking to everyone outside of the community uh, about what they find. But I remember being shown them when we when we first visited there. So it was at that moment that I realized that as a teacher, I had a responsibility to uh, learn, fully learn what happened, but then look back and find out how something like that could happen. What was the mechanism? What was the thinking that could that it could occur for a, something like a residential school to exist? And uh, it made me read the Indian Act, which I encourage people to do. It's a mountainous piece of legislation that still exists to this day. Um, and the, that one line that I, that I really settled on was the definition of a person that they created in 1876. Anyone other than an Indian is a person. And when you deny someone personhood, human rights, suddenly something like a residential school can happen. Reserves can happen. Um, a controlled economy can happen. All of these things. And so we go back there, it's under renovation now, so we go back there as much as we can. In the school, I'm, I'm very happy. We have a very good relationship with our two treaty partners, the Mississaugas of the Credit, which is our primary treaty partner, but the Haudenosaunee as well. Uh, they have a wonderful, the Mississaugas have a wonderful powwow. They would want me to tell you to come to it. It's in August. Uh, it's a great time. Uh, and then Six Nations, the Woodland Cultural Center is their museum. It's on the site of the residential school, but it also tells you the the larger history of the Haudenosaunee, uh, including the neutral nation, which there was uh, 30,000 people from the escarpment to Lake Huron, right here. Uh, there wasn't, a, there isn't a survey or a farm that has not found um, evidence of that, including the striker uh, plant that they just put in. They found all mountains and mountains of stuff. Although on, under Ontario law, that becomes property of the archeologist, not the nation or the, uh, or the government. So we, we are on Indigenous territory. I, I wanted to continue Thomas King's uh, lecture, Massey lecture. He writes, stories are wondrous things and they're dangerous. The native novelist Leslie Silco in her book Ceremony tells us how evil came into the world. It was witch people, witch people from all over the world way back when, and they came together for a witches' conference in a cave, having a good time. Contest, actually, to see who could come up with the scariest thing. Some of them brewed up potions in pots, and some of them jumped in and out of animal skins. Some of them thought up charms and spells, and it must have been fun to watch. Until finally, there was only one witch left who hadn't done anything. No one knew where this witch came from, or if the witch was male or female. And all this witch had was a story. Unfortunately, the story this witch told was an awful thing full of fear and slaughter, disease and blood. A story of murderous mischief. And when the telling was done, the other witches quickly agreed that this witch had won the prize. Okay, you win, they said. But what you just said now, it isn't so funny. It didn't sound so good. We were doing okay without that in our lives. Take it back, call back that story. But of course it's too late. For once a story is told, it cannot be called back. Once told, 
It is loose in the world. These graves are telling a story, and it's important for us to listen. And as Murray Sinclair, the former chair of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, he said once, uh, now you know the story, you can't take it back. So now what are we going to do about that? Thank you for listening. Thank you, Nathan. Thanks. Thank you, Nathan, for sharing that. I, um, I, I find it deeply humbling that somebody with your level of knowledge and expertise, somebody who was involved in the creation of the Sue Harrison natural area, um, uh, stands here and talks about and admits the time when you didn't know and, and how you came to know. And that, uh, that dovetails right into uh, to what we'll be talking about a little bit later. Um, and how we can move forward from our own ignorance to our own knowledge. Thank you for, for sharing that with us this morning. Let us uh, continue in singing Draw the Circle Wide. Our scripture reading today comes from the book of Hebrews from the New Testament, reading chapter 10, verses 15 through 18 and 23 through 25. Let us listen for God's word. And the Holy Spirit also testifies to us for after saying, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts and I will write them on their minds. He also adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who has promised is faithful. And let us consider how to provoke one another to love and good deeds, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. Have you um, ever broken a promise to anybody? Have you ever made a promise that you, for whatever reason, were not able to keep? 
How, how did you feel after, at that point when you realized you had broken your promise? Probably pretty crappy, I would guess. So what did you do in that moment of, of feeling like that and realizing that you had, had failed to keep your promise? What did you do? I, I expect most likely you probably apologized to the person that you had made the promise to and had broken. And when you did apologize, how did that person respond to you? Now, I expect they probably responded with a certain degree of disappointment. That's normal and natural when you've broken a promise to somebody. It's, it's normal for them to be disappointed and, and upset. That's, that's a reasonable reaction. But did they also respond with forgiveness? Maybe yes, maybe no. If, if they did, how did you feel afterwards? And if they didn't, how did you feel afterwards? Did you feel like at least you'd done the right thing in being accountable for your actions or lack of action in this case? Did you feel a, a little bit more settled inside feeling like you had done the right thing to correct or try to correct and undo the wrong thing? Did you feel like maybe even you had learned a lesson about yourself so that you could be more careful in the future with your promises and commitments? If you can learn a lesson about yourself in a setting like that, well then let me tell you, that works for the big lessons too. As you know, my, my daughter Hunter came out this spring as transgender. And as, you, as many of you know, I've been an advocate in the queer and transgender community for a quarter of a century. It's reasonable to conclude that I have a good deal of knowledge and experience in dealing with the rainbow community. But if you are around me in conversation with Hunter, you may have noticed me misgendering Hunter every now and then. And that's because for 18 and a half, well, for almost 19 years, Hunter was male in my mind. And it's going to take me longer than a few months to unlearn all of that tape in my head and replace it with a new tape of female pronouns. And that's okay. It's okay for me to make mistakes if I'm accountable for those mistakes. So if you hear me misgender her, you'll also hear me apologize to her right afterwards and correct myself. Like I said, that little lesson also works for the big lessons. That same principle works for how we understand our dealings with First Nations peoples. I have been wonderfully heartwarmed by how all of you folks here have embraced Hunter in her new identity and gone out of your way to try to honor and recognize her with correct pronouns, but don't feel paralyzed if you make a mistake. We need to give ourselves permission to make mistakes and to be accountable and to apologize and to seek forgiveness and to move on in right relations. And that is exactly the same disposition we need to adopt when dealing with our First Nations sisters and brothers. There is a thing which I have I named as heart freeze 
that some people get, I've seen, if you have a compassionate heart and you don't want to say the wrong thing. You know there's a right thing to say and you know there's a wrong thing to say. You know there's a right action to do and you know there's a wrong action to do, but you don't know what it is. And you're afraid that if you say something, you're going to say the wrong thing. And so rather than say or do the wrong thing, you say or do nothing. I want to offer you an alternative to heart freeze today, and that is to make mistakes compassionately and genuinely. And I'm going to keep coming back to the example of Hunter because that's a first person example that I, I can live and you've watched. When I screw up the pronouns with her and I apologize, she's not offended because she knows my heart is in the right place and she knows I'm trying to do the right thing and trying to say the right thing, but I'm still learning. And again, that's how we can address our First Nations people. By listening and learning and trying and getting it wrong and listening and learning and apologizing and trying again and getting it right and then getting it wrong and listening and learning and apologizing and getting it right and the more you take that risk to make a mistake with your heart in the right place the more you will learn and the more you will grow and the more you will live into right relations. We talked in June about the simple thing that we can do in learning the correct words and names for First Nations places and peoples. And we started practicing some of those words because it shows respect and gives dignity to a person to say their name correctly. And as you know, if you've ever seen any First Nations words or names written out, our English eyes look at those letters and they don't sound like they appear on the page. So if you're not sure how to say it correctly, ask, just ask. Picture yourself visiting a land where nobody speaks English and somebody comes up to introduce you to somebody else and they butcher your name. They don't get it correctly. How does that make you feel? It probably makes you feel like they don't care, like they didn't take the time to care enough to find out how to say your name correctly. Now, imagine that same scenario if that person comes up to you and says first, can you teach me how to say your name, how to pronounce your name correctly? And then they introduce you correctly. That tells you that person cares enough to ask. And what happens if they ask you to teach them how to say it correctly and they still get it wrong. Does that make you feel like they don't care? No, it makes you feel like they're making the effort in the right direction. They're trying. So you correct them, they try again, and eventually they get it right. It makes you still feel like that person cares about you. And that's one of the things that our First Nations peoples need right now from those of us who come from settler communities and backgrounds to know that somebody actually cares about their experiences, cares enough to ask, to listen, and to try to get it right, cares enough to listen, cares enough to learn, cares enough to learn from mistakes, 
cares enough to learn from tragedy. Our scripture reading today from Hebrews 10, Paul tells us, and quoting from the Old Testament, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their minds and I will write them on their minds. Now, you may recall from when we've talked about covenant in the past, a covenant is kind of like a contract. It's two people making an agreement with each other that is binding in some way, but it is different from a contract in that with a covenant, if one person breaks the contract, it doesn't let the other person out of the contract. They're still obligated to keep their part. And that's the nature of our relationship with God, that we as human beings continually screw up because we're not perfect. And we mess up that contract, that covenant we have with God, but God never breaks that contract with us. God is not released from God's side of that contract simply because we screw it up. We still have to try to make it right, but God does not abandon us because of it. In some ways, the Old Testament can be summed up, and all of the stories in the Old Testament can be summed up as an epic story of humanity making the covenant, screwing it up, trying to get it right, screwing it up again, trying to get it right, screwing it up again, and constantly asking for God's forgiveness and receiving God's forgiveness. This statement by Paul in Hebrews about the covenant also reminds us that in this form the covenant contains laws to live by. And those laws are not there to take away our freedoms and force us to follow God's authority. Those laws are there to teach us actions that show caring to other people. And how does God respond when we screw up? From the same passage, from verse 17, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. A treaty is a form of covenant. It's two peoples agreeing on how they will live in relationship with each other and how they will respect each other. And one side has repeatedly violated those treaty covenants. And our First Nations peoples are tired of having that trust betrayed in tragic ways. And the most horrible betrayal of trust of all has been the forced removal of their children and gross negligence leading to death. All in a misguided attempt, as Nathan was talking about, to erase their culture and replace it with our own. Because we in the settler community believed that we were superior and that they were not. And that language of superiority still exists today. So what do we do now? Well, Paul gives us some further guidance in Hebrews, and he says from, in verse 24, and let us consider how to provoke one another to love and good deeds. We can take that phrase, good deeds, and substitute a different phrase that we're familiar with in our conversation for today, and that is right relations. So let's substitute that into Paul's words and let us consider how to provoke one another to love and right relations. We cannot change the past. We cannot erase the horrible treatment that settler ancestors and settler governments and even our settler church have visited on our First Nations peoples. But we can start today, right now, to live into right relations, right this moment today. How? Ask. Don't assume. Start with the basic. 
Nathan shared with you the time when he didn't know. We all have a time of saying, I don't know, I need to learn, I need to ask. Start with the basic. Start with, as we talked about in June, how do I say your name correctly? And when you get it wrong, apologize and try again. Then move on to the harder question. What do you need from me in right relations? And make it more than a t-shirt, more than a hashtag. Take the time to learn history, to learn the history of the peoples who were here before us. Don't put that burden on them to teach us. Take the initiative to learn for yourself. Acknowledge what actually happened. Be willing to constantly learn, make mistakes, apologize, and try again and learn again. Let me ask you, back in June we talked about the children found in Kamloops. There were 215. Have you been paying attention? Do you know how many that number is up to now with the discoveries? This is something we need to pay attention to and learn. That number is now up to 6,509. I learned this week from my conversation with Nathan that the first draft of our land acknowledgement included a recognition of the Treaty of 1796. But I learned something new about that today, this week, and that is that that particular treaty was likely, I don't, I'm not sure it's not proven yet, but the evidence is supporting it. Am I getting that correct? Evidence is supporting that that treaty was actually a blank piece of paper which the First Nations peoples were asked to sign, and then the British, then British government, wrote in the terms afterwards. I also learned, and I'm going to check to make sure I'm getting it right, that uh, Anishinaabe are, in, are synonymous with Mississaugas, correct? Did I get that correct? Mississaugas are Anishinaabe. Mississaugas are Anish Anishinaabe. English. Sorry? It's like British and then the English. Excellent. So one is included in the other. See, I didn't quite get it right. I tried. Nathan corrected me. That's how we can do this. Tuesday, I'm taking the initiative to learn more. Nathan talked about the Woodland Cultural Center in Brantford. I'm going there on Tuesday to take the initiative to educate myself. Ask. Learn. Make mistakes, apologize, be accountable, repeat. I'll say that again. Ask, learn, make mistakes, apologize, be accountable, repeat. For our response song, uh, today we've chosen something a little special. Um, there's no words that you have uh, uh, printed, so it's, it's kind of a listen, feel song written by Alana Lewandowski, and it's written about residential schools, and, and through her conversations uh, she came up with this song. It's sung in the first person, which we have hardly... I don't know, we have no idea what they went through, uh, but we're going to try and attempt to sing it for you. It's, it's a two-person thing, so Sophia will sing one part, I'll sing the other. It's about a grandmother and her daughter.
before after each of the prayer sections you are to join me by saying now our minds are one we will continue the prayers that have been uh, we have been blessed with this morning when I picked up this book at the uh, Iroquois uh, Crossshore at, uh, at Oshawa the Earth Mother we are all thankful to our mother, the earth, for she gives us all that we need for life. She supports our feet as we walk upon, about upon her. It gives us joy that she continues to care for us as she has from the beginning of time. To our mother, we send greetings and thanks. Now, our minds are one. Now our minds are one. The waters. We give thanks to all the waters of the world for quenching our thirst and providing us with strength. Water is life. We know its power in many forms, waterfalls and rain, mists and streams, rivers and oceans. With one mind, we send greetings and thanks to the spirit of water. Now our minds are one. Now our minds are one. The thunderers. Now we turn to the west where our grandfathers the thunder beings live. Hey guys. With lightning and thundering voices, they bring our, with them the water that renews life. We bring our minds together as one to send greetings and thanks to our grandfathers, the thunderers. Now our minds are one. Now our minds are one. She's talking about your shirts. Your grandma's talking about your Grandmother shirts. Grandmother Moon. Listening to her? Yeah, listen. She's got some. We put our minds stuff. together and give thanks to our oldest grandmother, sit, just sit right here the Moon. He lights the nighttime sky. She is okay. the leader. He said, "What's her name?" Yeah. Okay. She is the leader of women all over the world and she governs the movement of the ocean tides. By her changing face, we measure time, and it is the moon who watches over the arrival of children here on Earth. With one mind, we send greetings and thanks to our grandmother, the moon. Now our minds are one. Now our minds are one. The enlightened teachers, we gather our minds 
to greet and thank the enlightened teachers who have come to help throughout the ages. When we forget how to live in harmony, they remind us of the way we were instructed to live as people. With one mind, we send greetings and thanks to these caring teachers. Now our minds are one. Now our minds are one. The Creator. Now we turn our thoughts to the Creator, our Great Spirit, and send greetings and thanks for all the gifts of creation. Everything we need to live a good life is here on this Mother Earth. For all the love that is still around us, we gather our minds together as one and send our choicest words of greetings and thanks to the Creator. Now our minds are one. Now our minds are one. And all God's people say together, Amen. Our closing set is uh, When Hands Reach Out Beyond Divides and the River Is Here.
We have now arrived at the place where we end our words. Of all the things we have named, it was not our intention to leave anything out. If something was forgotten, we leave it to each individual to send such greetings and thanks in their own way. And now our minds are one. And now our minds are one. God bless folks and we'll see you next week.